Okay. Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this uh, first uh, webinar uh, being organized by the Interdisciplinary Research Center for Construction and Building Materials using the KEX uh, platform. And uh, I would like to welcome uh, our uh, director for IRCCBM, Dr. Muhammad Al Osta, and our speaker today, Dr. Saeed Adekunle. Today, we start our first uh, webinar, which will be a series of webinar uh, at repeated intervals, um, either bi monthly or uh, sometimes uh, even monthly. Uh, on various topics of interest uh, and research, which is in progress at uh, Interdisciplinary Research Center for Construction and Building Materials. And today we are starting with a really uh, an exciting topic, which is a major area of concern uh, worldwide. And uh, you all know the, about the global warming and the importance of carbon sequestration uh, in order to combat this uh, effects of uh, global warming is a very important and uh, interesting research area worldwide. And that IRC CBM, in addition to a lot of uh, various areas on which we are concentrating carbon sequestration uh, is one of the important areas under the center. And uh, we plan to execute various research uh, projects in this uh, particular area, uh, which is of growing interest worldwide. So uh, we will start this uh, presentation by introducing uh, the speaker today. Our speaker today is uh, Dr. Saeed the uh, Kunle, Dr. Said is uh, uh, assistant professor at civil and environmental engineering department in the university, and he is an affiliate for the interdisciplinary research center for construction and building materials, and uh, he did his uh, bachelor's uh, from. Uh, Nigeria, and then he joined KFUPM from where he completed his uh, master's and uh, PhD degree. And then he joined the civil and Eng engineering department as an assistant professor. And uh, he will be our speaker today. And before I invite him to start, uh, uh, you will see a Q&A box at the, in your screen. So, um, Go ahead and start uh, writing your questions in the Q&A box, and uh, we'll try to answer at the end of the presentation uh, those uh, questions. And then also, if time permits, we can take some direct questions uh, from those who will uh, raise their hands. So it will be good if we can start uh, uh, during the presentation, you can start putting in your uh, uh, questions. So let's... Uh, turn over the platform to our speaker today, Dr. Said. Welcome, Dr. Said. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kalim. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the director of uh, IRCCBM, uh, Dr. Mohammed al uh, Dr. Kalim, uh, the chairman of civil engineering department, and all the stakeholders here present, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. And if you are joining outside of the kingdom, good evening and good morning, uh, depending on uh, what time of the day you are over there. Uh, as mentioned rightly by Dr. Kalim, my name is Saeed Adekune, and I'm your speaker today on this KICS technical webinar which is titled Carbon Sequestration in Construction Materials. Uh, to start with, 
Let's have a look at the outline of today's presentation. Uh, we start with some introductory notes and the introduction may be a little bit elaborate. And the reason for the elaborate is introduction is that this discussion or this uh, webinar is more like an open webinar to open uh, a new frontier of research as well as follow up discussions. So we like to like prepare the mind of the community uh, towards what we are trying to do. So we'll have some elaborate introduction or background. And then inshallah in the near future, we'll go into specific details where we focus more on technicalities. Today will be more general than, than specific. So we do the introduction and then we go over to talk about the carbon capture and sequestration technology. Then we move on to construction materials and the relationship with the carbon landscape. And then we talk about carbon sequestration in construction materials, which is the main theme, the theme of this discussion. And then we will talk about the carbon utilization studies that has been conducted uh, here at KFEPM. And then we make some concluding remarks. All right. So uh, what you can see on the screen is uh, evidence, a very uh, empirical evidence pointing to the anthropological influence on the global climate change. And what you can see here is that uh, the average uh, global temperature uh, with reference to the pre-industrial revolution era you can see in black that the observed global average temperature continues to rise. And this rise in the global average temperature became actually more drastic when you look at uh, 1955 and after that period. And these are the period when industrial revolution became more intensive. And it is very obvious from what we can see that of course there are some fluctuations in the global climate, but we can see that the natural fluctuation or the natural drivers cannot, escape, cannot explain what has been observed starting from the early, uh, uh, like 1950s and, and, and up to the current date. So, and that's why uh, most experts concluded that it's extremely likely that human activities are responsible for the, uh, or they are the dominant factor responsible for the rise of the global average temperature starting from the 1950s. And uh, now the concern of this uh, higher average global temperature uh, became uh, the talk of most global communities uh, over the past decade. And there are some efforts at addressing the anthropological causes of global warming. When we talk about anthropological causes, we are talking about causes related to human activities. Okay, so emission of greenhouse gases, uh, they, they are things we cannot avoid with respect to our current civilization, because the moment we continue to overgo, uh, uh, undergo rapid development, then we expect to have a lot of emission of greenhouse gases. And that is why most nations that are developing rapidly are major contributors of greenhouse gas emission. And the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is not exempted because this is one of the most rapidly developing countries of the world. Then we are a major contributor to emission of greenhouse gases. And that's why in 2015 edition of the Climate Change uh, Performance Index, which is an index published by a German organization, Saudi Arabia scored 21.08 to rank as the last on the list. And in Saudi Arabia became the last on the list in terms of the index. And it is interesting to note that even as of 2021 that we're talking, 
The only improvement we made so far is that we rank now better by one step, 60 out of 61. And that's why uh, the kingdom was a party to the historic, historic uh, Paris climate deal uh, that was reached on uh, 12 December 2015. And this climate deal uh, is about trying to reduce uh, the global average temperature to less than two degrees Celsius above the industrial revolution uh, average value. And it's preferable to reduce it to even lower than 1.5 Celsius above the, the reference value. So the concern, constant effort has to be taken on all fronts, especially as we are scientists, we need to make scientific effort to really help the government to fulfill the mission uh, or, or the commitment on the climate performance uh, activities. And we can see a lot of things have been launched at uh, initiative uh, locally in the kingdom uh, just to uh, address the emission issues associated with our development here. And this is uh, what they call the Saudi Green Initiative, which has a lot of programs meant to address the local emission in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And uh, this is on the patronage of His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince, Ben Salman, uh, and a lot of things are uh, going on. Uh, in, it includes the Circular Carbon Economic Program. And there are a host of programs under this initiative, which is meant to address the local emission. And recently, we read in the news that uh, the King has pledged to attain net zero emission by 2060. And we will be joining Russia and China by the same targeted uh, time. And by the way, the uh, US and European Union target 2050. So just like a decade after, we hope to attain net zero uh, uh, emission status. Now, before we continue our discussion, let's try to look at major greenhouse gases. And as it's a common knowledge, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrate oxide are the major greenhouse gases that are direct effect of industrial activities. Now, it is so, uh, it's so important to highlight that 75% of the greenhouse gases is CO2, or CO2 constitutes 75% of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And this is not surprising if you look at the CO2 concentration trend over uh, the past history of the earth. And you can see this uh, rapid shoot up in the recent uh, century, which shows that apart from the global uh, historical fluctuations, we have a significant increase in the CO2 uh, atmospheric concentration. And this can be seen even in the recent era uh, starting from 1950, you can see that up to the time we are speaking, we are already passing the threshold of 400 ppm as CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And that's why CO2 has been a major focus of many scientific efforts to address the uh, greenhouse emission or greenhouse gases emission. So now one of the main ways, but main, uh, approaches to address the emission of the greenhouse gases uh, is the carbon capture and sequestration technology. This technology uh, is like the host, the basket of technological endeavors, which entails capture of CO2 and storing the CO2 in a stable form. Capture means it could be captured from the atmosphere or captured from point emission sources or from mobile uh, emission sources, okay? Use different scientific uh, approaches. When you capture CO2 in any way possible, you need to store CO2 somewhere because if you don't store the CO2, then you will run out of uh, physical gas storage. So CO2 storage can be done uh, using the 
aquatic storage technology in which uh, aquatic is a kind of biological uh, carbon storage. Uh, CO2 is pumped massively under the ocean and uh, through other methods. There is the geologic storage you can pump CO2 uh, into sand aquifers or depleted oil reservoir or in coal beds and so on and so forth. The idea of geological storage of CO2 is that under conditions of high temperature and pressure under the earth, CO2 over several decades will become stable and it will stay there forever. This is the assumption, okay? But the issue with geological storage is that it is very expensive and it is also, uh, it has associated difficulties. There could be some leakages of CO2 after some years. There is a lot of problems and there are a lot of problems with geological storage. However, the geological storage of CO2 is still a major way to store CO2 in terms of the capacity of the CO2 it can take. And then we have the terrestrial carbon storage. Terrestrial means storing carbon uh, over the land in a way that it will be stable and, and useful using different technologies. So it's a time to examine this idea of terrestrial carbon sequestration. Terrestrial carbon sequestration, as mentioned earlier, it's about converting CO2 to useful and stable forms, especially for small or from small and medium uh, emission sources. CO2 can be converted into industrial useful products. And also there is the uh, mineral, mineral, mineral terrestrial carbon sequestration. This mineral sequestration uh, involves mining of magnesium oxide and, and calcium oxide rich minerals and try to make reaction between this oxide and CO2. So this reaction actually uh, can help to convert CO2 to the carbonate form, which is stable. However, this is also very expensive because you have to mine this oxide from the earth. Now, instead of mining the oxide, there is a, an emerging area of terrestrial carbon sequestration. And this is carbon sequestration in construction materials. And the notable uh, uh, material of construction is concrete. And concrete, as we all know, is a, a heterogeneous mixture of sand and stone particles mixed with cement, water, and some chemical and mineral add-ons. You see, we highlight cement as a constituent of concrete because cement is the most important concrete constituent because cement binds everything together, okay? And this is very important uh, to examine what cement is all about. Cement is an industrial manufacture material which actually uh, is very sensitive to carbon. Sensitive in the sense that the cement manufacturer, as you can see, entails uh, you quarrying or collecting the raw materials, which are mainly materials from the earth, okay? They are geologic materials, then transporting and processing this material into what we call cement. And as shown on the screen, about 80 to 90% of the raw material for cement manufacture is limestone, which is calcite or calcium carbonate, of course, with traces of magnesite. Only a minor constituent uh, uh, is the clay mudstone or shale. The clay mudstone or shale component of cement raw material contribute alumina and ferrite and silica, okay? And this mixture is ground and mixed and sent into the rotary kiln at very high temperature uh, between 1450 and 1550 Celsius. And then the outcome of the entire uh, thermal treatment 
is what we call clinker. This clinker, if you intergrind with gypsum, then it becomes what we call cement. Of course, accompanied with some waste products. Now, what is more important to note on this slide is the extremely high temperature of cement manufacture. This high temperature so shows that a lot of energy goes into cement manufacture. And if you now add to this energy to raise this high temperature, add to it the energy consumed in quarrying of the raw material, add this to the energy consumed in transportation, you realize that the manufacture of cement is energy intensive. And in most places, or at most places today, this energy comes from fossil fuels. And that means the cement manufacture itself is a major source of carbon emission into the atmosphere. As if this is not enough, consider the energy intensity of cement manufacture. Let's look into the chemistry of cement itself or the thermochemistry of cement production. Cement, like I mentioned in the, on the previous slide, you need high temperature to activate the raw materials. And this uh, results into a series of thermochemical processes involving the formation of the major phases of cement, which are alite, belite, silite, and ferrite. As you can see here, the alite reaction is about fusion of the calcite or calcium carbonate and silica. And it makes what is alite. And you can see the last product, which is highlighted in the alite formation reaction, is CO2 molecules. Okay? If you look, look at the belite formation thermochemistry, you realize that CO2 is also a product. And the story is not different from the formation of silite and ferrite. All of them release CO2 as a product of uh, mineral, 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 mineralization. It means CO2 is a major uh, chemical product of cement manufacture. And we know that CO2 is a major greenhouse gas as we showed on the previous slide. It, it follows, it follows that we are not going to look into the energy consumption of cement manufacture alone. We look into the CO2 itself as a product of cement manufacture. When combined together, it has been estimated that every ton of cement manufactured results into 800 kg approximately of CO2. In fact, some analysts would prefer to say it's a one-to-one -one ratio. In other words, we can assume or we can approximate the CO2 uh, coming out of cement manufacture, consider the energy consumption and the CO2 formation in the production itself. So one ton of every cement particle produced give one ton of CO2 released into the atmosphere if not captured, okay? And therefore, five to 7% of global anthropogenic CO2 emission comes from the manufacture of cement and related activities. In addition to this waste product, which we call cement kiln dust. And this is a major concern to note that the construction industry is a major contributor to CO2 emission. This estimate of five to 7% coming from cement manufacture and related activities is an old estimate. It is worrisome to note that due to the rapid development of many nations of the world, the cement production continues to increase. As you can see on the slide, you can see that uh, it is estimated that the global cement production by 2050 can reach 6 billion metric tons per year. 
Six billion metric tons means if nothing is done, we want to release six billion metric tons of CO2 from cement manufacture alone into the atmosphere by 2050. And let us try to look at this in the context of Saudi Arabia. In 2019, Saudi Arabia manufactured 3.5 million metric tons of cement. And come to 2020, there is 18% increment in this number. And in 2020, we manufactured 4.1 million metric tons of cement. It means alone in Saudi Arabia last year, we just released into the atmosphere 4.1 metric tons of CO2, you see? So it shows that cement industry or the construction industry is a major concern when it comes to uh, carbon generation into the atmosphere. It shows or it proves or it enlightens that those of us uh, scientists in the construction industry, uh, we are more responsible to participate actively in the effort of carbon sequestration, which is basically trying to utilize carbon in a way that will be useful and stable. And this is why construction industry has to be a major stakeholder in carbon capture and carbon utilization. And of course, a lot of effort has been done so far. And now we like to examine the available technologies in the construction industry for carbon utilization. The first technology I like to examine here is called acceleration carbonation curing. This entails producing some concrete members and place these members or this concrete element in a pressurized container where we pump in CO2. CO2 can be pumped in as a gas, which has been purified. We can also use flue gases, which are the raw captured CO2 from uh, emission sources, maybe from uh, uh, cement manufacturing industries or from power generation plants. So the raw captured CO2 or cleaned and refined CO2 can be pumped onto young concrete element. When we say young concrete, we mean concrete that have not been fully formed in terms of strength development. And this is important to make them young or to use this technology when concrete is still young, because young concrete have chemical constituents, which is mainly calcium hydroxide or, or what we call Portlandite. This Portlandite has affinity for CO2 because Portlandite re reacts with CO2 to form calcite or calcium carbonate. So this will make CO2 to go into this concrete and stay in a stable form. And it means our buildings can have CO2 stored in them. And this is going to be a major contribution from the construction industry. However, this accelerated carbonation curing or ACC can only be applied to precast concrete element. Precast element are those elements which you have to cast first, and then you can utilize them in construction. Because you have to put the element in a closed container, apply CO2, and apply pressure. So they have to be precast. But precast concrete is not the dominant concrete production mode. Of course, precast concrete is a major mode of concrete production and utilization, but it is not the dominant. Uh, at present, the dominant mode is ready mixed concrete. Ready mixed concrete also can be utilized for carbon utilization. And this is done by admixing CO2 with the concrete during the production phase. So when concrete is being mixed, uh, we can admix CO2 with concrete. I'm trying to share here 
Here is a company that is based in the US. So this company is called Carbon Cure. Uh, they just deployed the technology of CO2 admixing, okay? And with this CO2 admixing, we can actually use uh, CO2 or carbon neutralization in ready mixed concrete. It doesn't have to be precast. Of course, you may even try to add mix CO2 with concrete and then you can precast or you can place concrete in situ. So it means there is a, uh, a lot of effort in the construction industry towards utilizing CO2 in all possible forms because we are highly responsible as major generators of carbon into the atmosphere. Apart from the CO2 admixing technology, we can also uh, uh, capture CO2 in facade materials and finishing materials. So there are a lot of chemicals which can be incorporated in concrete so that when you use this concrete for finishing or for facade, facade are the outer decoration element uh, on constructions and on building infrastructure. Over time, over time, CO2 comes naturally, naturally CO2 goes into concrete over time. But because the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is very, very low, so the rate of CO2 capture in concrete over time is very, very low. However, we can enhance the atmospheric capture of CO2 by finishing materials through the incorporation of special ingredients that will enhance speedy capture of CO2. A lot of research efforts are going in this direction. So now we have highlighted three different alternatives for CO2 utilization in construction materials. But I like to focus on the first alternative, which is the accelerated carbon curing technology, ACC. Okay, now let's try to focus on ACC. What is ACC? If you remember, remember the previous slide which I showed about cement manufacture, I showed a similar slide, okay? I showed the thermochemistry of formation of a light, B light, Portland light. Sorry, a light, B light, C light, and ferrets, okay? But interestingly, when you mix cement with water, cement forms some hydrates. Cement strength development is a hydration process, okay? And it's exothermic. Exothermic, heat is released. And this process can also be enhanced by pumping more heat to accelerate the process. But what I want to uh, re uh, make reference to in the formation of cement hydrates are uh, that these A light, B light, ferrite, and C light they go into different forms, which are, are called uh, CSH. So as this CSH basically uh, is like a fusion of, of calcium, silica, uh, and silica uh, you know, subcomponents, okay? But if you look at the first two reactions, which I'm showing here, you will see it's like a reversal of the A light and B light formation. Because if you pump CO2 under pressure or on special conditions to the cement hydrate, okay, it will CO2 will go back into this hydrate and bring out calcite, which was the original raw material that was broken down thermally. Okay, and this process is exothermic; it releases uh, 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 heat. If you look at the B-light itself, B-light also can combine with CO2 and it can, not in the original B-light form, but it can convert with, C conf I mean, combine with CO2 in the hydrate form. And by the way, because we are doing ACC on young concrete, young concrete is a mixture of unhydrated 
cement minerals, some hydrate of cement, and Portlandite, which is calcium hydroxide. It's a young concrete. So you will be having a mixture of unhydrated cement and hydrated cement. But the unhydrated components are the A light and B light that we're showing. They can combine with CO2 in the presence of water to form calcite. And most importantly, Portlandite is a formation product of cement hydration. Portlandite can also combine with CO2 to form calcite. And some small uh, brucite available in the hydrated cement can also combine with CO2 to form magnesite. So all of this hydration or the CO2 combination chemical reactions, we, as you can see on the right side, they will give us carbonate. All of these carbonates are thermodynamically stable, means they cannot break down spontaneously. So they are safe and stable form of carbon in construction material. And how does this ACC work? Uh, you can see below on that slide that when you pump CO2 into a young concrete, the outer layer actually absorbs CO2 and the carbonate is formed in the outer layer. This carbonate precipitates in the microscopic and nanoscopic pores of concrete to give that concrete element an outer shell, which is very dense and much more quality as compared to the inner core of the concrete member. So the implication of this highly dense outer shell is that it will, it will prevent moisture from escaping from the concrete element, and that will help the curing process without you having to add moisture to cure concrete or having to apply steam as done in precast technology. And this means we can take out steam from concrete curing, and that will save some energy and save some carbon emission. And simultaneously, we are utilizing CO2 in a stable form in concrete. In addition to that, the chemical reaction of ACC is exothermic. And the heat released from the reaction going on in the outer shell also radiates towards the core. The release of heat to the core actually uh, enhances the hydration process to make sure that the hydration process can proceed faster. And this is double benefits, utilization of carbon and enhancement of technical performance of CO2 cured concrete. So this is the workings of accelerated carbonation curing technology. Now let's talk about the problems with the ACC technology, okay? Uh, it is important to note that concrete as a mechanical material is weak in tension and very strong in compression. And due to the weak tension response of concrete, then it is traditional to place steel bars in concrete to enhance its mechanical uh, response. Now, these steel bars in concrete, if we use concrete member containing steel bars in ACC technology, the result is not favorable. Because as shown on the screen, there is like a passive layer over the steel bar in concrete. This passive layer developed because concrete is highly alkaline material. This high alkalinity between 12 and 13 pH makes the passive layer over the steel highly stable. But when you pump in CO2 uh, in concrete, the outer layer which has reacted with CO2, CO2 is acidic. It will dealkalize the concrete and make it less alkaline. Less alkaline means the pH will reduce. Sorry, the pH will reduce. Reduced pH means we lose the passive layer over the steel, and the loss of passive layer 
will result into corrosion problem. And as you can see, if CO2 goes into concrete, the PFD drops and corrosion could be uh, triggered at an early stage and the corrosion uh, uh, product will expand and cause cracks in the concrete. It looks like the FCC technology uh, is not favorable to reinforce concrete members. And that's why most scientists working in this area, they advise that the SCC should be done lightly to make sure that the penetration of carbon front uh, is not so deep into the concrete member. Uh, but interestingly, interestingly, some researchers, most especially at KFEPN, we discovered that there are ways to enhance the retention of concrete alkalinity so that we can actually do ACC and penetrate to the deepest core of concrete without dropping the pH significantly. And so ACC can be done as you like in concrete based on our discovery and the discovery of other scientists without any fear of corrosion problem associated with uh, the alkalization of concrete. Now, this is about SCC, and now it's a good time to talk about carbon utilization studies at KFPM. Uh, we have done so far a review of the carbon utilization technology in general, and we have tried to focus more on SCC as a viable technology for utilizing carbon in concrete, now we'd like to talk about what we have done so far at KFPM over a couple of years. This is just like some simple result, very uh, small result we want to show us today. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, this presentation is a general eye-opening presentation, okay? It's not meant to be so detailed in terms of technicalities with regards to our participation in this area. Inshallah, in the near future, we'll bring a lot of technical output in terms of scientific results in this area, which we have achieved at KFPM. But just for the sake of flash, let's try to examine a few of our local results uh, in this area of carbon utilization in concrete at KFPM. Now, on the screen is one study conducted uh, around five years ago, and you can see that just in a span of 10 hours, we're able to raise the compressive strength of concrete significantly uh, by the use of CO2 as a means of curing as against the traditional curing technique. And as you can see on the screen, we try different uh, ACC pressures, and we find out that there is no significant difference uh, between the performance of ACC pressures. So that research that was conducted was focused on the use of 20 PSI a pressure in the carbonation chamber to cure our concrete element. Okay, so in the same research, we achieved these CO2 uptake uh, levels. As you can see, over a span of 10 hours, we're able to uh, capture 6% by the mass of dry cement in concrete in terms of CO2. And if for every, K, every one kg of cement used in this material, we're able to see 60 grams of CO2 captured. So this is some good achievement uh, because not only that we're able to capture CO2 in this concrete, that capture resulted in accelerated strength enhancement and also enhance the durability performance of, of concrete without necessarily affecting, uh, it enhanced the technical performance without affecting the durability performance negatively. In addition, and Dr. To this Saeed, you have to uh, you have to uh, uh, wind it up so that uh, we can ask questions also. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Dr. Khalil. So, in addition to this study, uh, recently we also conducted uh, a study 
Uh, as was shown previously, CKD is a major byproduct of cement manufacture, and CKD is highly alkaline, and it's a major byproduct of cement manufacture. Uh, for every kg of cement manufacture, you have about 150 grams of CKD uh, coming out. So CKD was incorporated in concrete here at KFEPM, and we try to use this to enhance the carbon uptake in concrete. Because CKD is highly alkaline, it will help to combat the possible challenges of the alkalization. Now, from this research, uh, we are able to use two different uh, CKDs. And as you can see on the screen, when CKD is uh, used, CKD itself has a lot of calcite and a lot of lime. And lime content of CKD is our target in this material, just to enhance the CO2 capture ability of our concrete. And the result is that in this research, we're able to raise the bar from 7% by mass of dry cement, we're able to raise the bar to as high as 14% by mass of cement, by simply incorporated this waste material called CKD. And I don't want to go into technical details of this uh, particular research work. Uh, just like I said earlier on, this is more like eye-opening presentation. It's general, not specific. And before we close our discussion, uh, let's try to examine some of our some sample publications which came out of our scientific effort in terms of uh, carbon utilization in construction material. So this is one sample publication, and this is another one. Here is another sample publication. And I'd like to mention that about four uh, technical journal papers are uh, under different stages of review, uh, both peer review and uh, pre-submission reviews. And we will communicate the result of these studies, inshallah, in, in the course of time, uh, whenever uh, we are free to do so. Uh, and this is just uh, my presentation uh, on the topic, carbon utilization or carbon sequestration in construction materials. I hope you got some senses from this presentation and hope in your different areas of scientific endeavor, you might have seen some benefit in collaborating with workers in the construction industry to enhance the effort of carbon utilization and assisting the vision of the kingdom to attain net zero emission by 2060. Thank you so much for your attention and your attendance. I will expect your questions if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Saeed, uh, for this uh, um, ex excellent presentation on the, an exciting topic. And uh, now uh, it's uh, time for some questions. Uh, right now we have only two of them. Uh, one is from uh, Rida al sagaf How can we maintain the alkalinity of concrete using CO2 admixing method to avoid corrosion of the rebar? Is it economically good? Yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, for that question uh, because uh, uh, again, I'm showing on the screen the technology of CO2 admixing. Uh, this is a controlled dosage, okay? As you can see, CO2 is pumped uh, at atmospheric pressure. It's not under, under pressure. And by the way, in this technology here, what, what you are seeing pumped here, is a raw cap captured emission. It's a CO2 which has been partially purified from power plant capture, okay? So, but this injection process is highly controlled in such a way that we don't allow 100% carbonation. If you allow 100% carbonation, as I showed earlier on, all the elite and the bellite minerals in cement will be converted into carbonates and there'll be no room for further hydration. It will really affect us negatively. So what they do here is to control the injection rate and the injection volume. 
in such a way that only a tiny fraction of the potential to capture CO2 is utilized. And the results are very exciting because the strength of this material is slightly above the strength of traditional material without CO2 admixing. Not only that, this material performs excellently in durability uh, measures as compared to traditional material. So it offers technical and economic and environmental benefits. And by the way, again, durability is not affected, okay, in CO2 admixing. Okay, so okay. I, th I think this is uh, good for your question. Is it okay, Mr. Rida? I, yeah, I think so. That's great. So let's go to the next question. What, what's the amount of CO2 produced uh, per ton after employing technologies for utilizing carbon dioxide? Uh, you mean the... Uh, I the mean, if, I, if in the carbon dioxide, uh, uh, if you use carbon dioxide in concrete making, then uh, at a cement factory, then what would be the amount of carbon dioxide still released? That's what he's asking most about. Okay, okay. okay, first of all, I mentioned earlier on that one ton of cement releases about one ton of CO2, okay? This is like 100% by mass of cement produced is the CO2 released into the atmosphere. But this CO2 comes from two sources. One is the CO2 product in the thermochemistry of cement manufacture, and the other is the CO2 uh, which is released in energy production to power the cement manufacture. Okay, but over time, we are transitioning from fossil fuel based energy source into more sustainable energy sources. That's number one. Number two, there is a lot of effort going on to reduce the amount of cement used in concrete itself. So, reducing the amount of cement used itself will reduce the amount of cement produced. Number three, now as we have established, we can also bring in CO2 into cement products. All in all, it is possible for concrete production or the, the construction industry to go into a very small net carbon emission. And this net carbon emission could go as low as only 20%. From 100%, we can come down to 20%. This 20% can be taken care of by the other technologies for carbon utilization out of the construction industry. Thank you. Okay, uh, next uh, uh, we have a hand raised. Dr. Shamshad Ahmed is uh, uh, wanted to ask a question. Dr. Shamshad, you're unmuted. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. First of all, I would like to uh, congratulate for such a nice presentation by Dr. Saeed. Uh, secondly, it would have been much better if you would have been knowing who are the attendees among us. I don't know. Uh, usually it is displayed, uh, but we'll check inshallah for, uh, in the future. Uh, the name of attendees should appear. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Saeed, for your good compilation of the information and updating us. Uh, in fact, this uh, work was started five, six years before. Okay, uh, with a good project. Uh, this was three year duration project. And uh, myself and Dr. Maslehuddin, uh, Alhamdulillah, proposed this work. And many people worked. Our student, Dr. Uh, this engineer, Rida, worked uh, hard. Uh, actually, uh, I, 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 I would like to congratulate uh, engineer Rida Sagaf uh, for working hard and making it possible. Uh, today uh, to show some work done already at KFUPM, alhamdulillah. Uh, Dr. Saeed, can you go to slide number 19? Uh, okay. Uh, slide number 19, if you can go quickly. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, recently, uh, uh, I wanted to submit a paper. Uh, uh, another student engineer, um, Mohashin, on ultra high performance concrete effect of the carbonation, we tried to submit to a journal which is very much uh, specific to CO2 sequestration. Okay, uh, the title of the journal itself is CO2 utilization. 
uh, very big concern some reviewers raised uh, that uh, they are very much focused towards the quantity of the carbon dioxide uh, which can be sequestered. They are not at all interested, uh, unfortunately, uh, to know about the beneficial impact of this uh, accelerated carbonation curing on the mechanical properties and durability uh, characteristics of concrete, unfortunately. Uh, so, um, and uh, because people are seeing more towards consumption of uh, carbon dioxide rather than improvement in the, uh, in the, in the quality of the concrete. So uh, having said that, I would like to know um, that, and I'm happy that Dr. Saeed reported uh, that uh, the consumption has been increased from seven to eight, 14 percent by mass of the cement if he is going to use the, <clears throat> the, the waste material, cement kiln dust. Uh, it is his uh, startup project, I know. Uh, okay, so go back to, uh, so apart from that, this is one way. Uh, but uh, in order to uh, scientifically explain uh, to someone or to, to for us uh, also, it is important to know the correlation between the amount of the carbon dioxide which can be sequestered in any cementitious material, either mortar or concrete, and uh, with the help of the, uh, uh, the kinetics of the reaction. Can you go back to the reaction again, 19, slide number 19? So, Dr. Saeed, if, uh, yeah. Is there any paper who is reporting about uh, using the left and right uh, equilibrium of this equation so that we can find out uh, if this is my alite, belite, phyllite, and salite content okay, uh, of the cement I'm using, and this is the quantity. Uh, can we calculate? Can we develop some equation to calculate uh, with, uh, with the help of the chemistry of the hydration of the cement, how much carbon yeah. dioxide could be, apart from the experimental measurement? Is there any way? Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you. you so much, uh, Professor Shamshad. Mm. Uh, just picking up from the last point, last question which you raised, uh, it's been reported widely in the literature. Uh, many, uh, uh, some scientists have actually come up with uh, uh, the stoichiometry. The stoichiometry of uh, carbon utilization in, in cement. And there is a very clear stoichiometry where we can calculate the theoretical carbon optic, okay? But remember that the theoretical optic is a limiting level which we cannot achieve practically, because as you can see on the screen, when you react CO2 with uh, the outer shell, the outer shell becomes denser and it will make further penetration more difficult for CO2. So that will not be able to attain the theoretical uh, limiting level, but uh, it is clear. We have a theoretical stoichiometry to know how much we can actually capture in cement-based material based on the amount of the constituent. It is very clear and established in the literature, okay? And again, it's a limiting level which we cannot attain practically. So what we try to do as scientists is to try to push as high as possible to this limit level. Theoretically, we should be able to go up to like 30%, okay? But we cannot be able to push beyond like 20, 25% at max. So we just have to try our best to see how far we can push towards the yeah. theoretical. Uh, uh, okay, let's, let's move to the next question because there are many questions. Let's answer everybody. Dr. Sai, okay. try to brief in your answers. Uh, uh, let's. Take the question from uh, Salami Babatunde. Was carbon dioxide ably pumped into the concrete developed quantified? That means was the carbon dioxide pump quantified and what was the maximum so far achieved? And thanks for a nice presentation. Dr. Sai. Uh, if I got the question right, it was asking if the admix. Is maximum the quantity of carbon dioxide pump into the concrete so far. Uh, the quantity pumped into you, you mean the the percentage or what? I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, sometime if you have any idea about the percentage of uh, carbon dioxide that is pumped, because the yeah. Shamshad was mentioning just now that uh, probably the utilization of carbon dioxide in uh, uh, concrete would be very low, and uh, we uh, we are looking about twenty yeah. gigaton of uh, carbon dioxide to be uh, sequestered. So, is uh, 
uh, sequestering carbon dioxide and uh, concrete uh, would be something uh, a big achievement in terms of uh, the quantity of uh, carbon dioxide that can be sequestered. Yeah, well, uh, when, it will, when we look at the admixed concrete, uh, admixed uh, CO2 admixing technology, and if we also look at the, uh, the, the normal uh, accelerated, uh, accelerated uh, combustion curing, we will realize again that uh, there is a possibility to attain up to 20%. It's possible, like on this slide here. You can see that uh, we attain about 14% of cement content. So the quantity will be known in terms of percentage. Okay, so if we achieve 14% of cement mass here, it depends on your cement content. And then you can calculate how much you can pump. And it, it varies a lot uh, with regard to the cement content, cement type, and the technology. But in general- yeah, And, uh, and uh, actually there are many companies now in Canada which are really uh, directly using carbon dioxide in ready mix concrete plant. and. Uh, we know that two concrete plants over here in uh, Saudi Arabia are also uh, uh, trying to directly inject carbon dioxide into the freshly mixed concrete. So hopefully, I mean, this is one way you cannot, uh, I mean, I, we all, uh, what uh, uh, needs to be pointed out that it not be a very big megaton uh, uh, sequestration, but it is contributing somehow to the uh, sequestration. Next question from Dr. Alosta. Yes, uh, assalamu alaikum. I uh, uh, just want to uh, say uh, many thanks for attending the first webinar organized by the CBM uh, with the help of CAKES as well as Dr. Kaleem and Dr. Saeed. Thank you for this uh, very nice uh, presentation. And inshallah, in the coming months, uh, as I mentioned by Dr. Kaleem, there will be a very exciting topics like today's topic. What I want to highlight, I, want, I don't want to ask any question. Uh, in general, I want to see that the center plans to develop a system and uh, materials that contribute to the economy and environmental development of the kingdom in the line, inshallah, with the uh, guidelines provided in the vision 2030. Uh, Dr. Omar, I think he asked the uh, question and he said, uh, the, the, uh, what can I see? Uh, we can replace the steel reinforcement uh, by the GFRB uh, bars and uh, to overcome uh, any problem coming from the corrosion. Uh, anyway, uh, in the end, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, you to join our center if you are interested uh, in participating in one more of the bland research teams. Thank you so much, and we, uh, that's it. Uh, next question from Dr. Vora. Yes, Dr. Vora. Dr. Shahid, uh, uh, two questions. Number one, you had shown the stoichiometry, right? So maybe yes. for which reactant is the limited limiting reactant? Uh, sorry, yes. is that which reaction is? Which, which reactant, reactant, out of okay. all the, which reactant is the limiting reactant out of all the chemistry equations that you have shown? This extent. Okay, let, let, let me go to, let me go to the reaction page, okay? Yeah, the you Allah khair, if I highlight. Can you see my to overcome. So here, uh, we don't have anyone that is specifically a, lim a limiting reactant, if I get your question very well. All of the reactants actually, uh, of course, they, they competitively participate in the reaction process, but none of them is limiting. The, and the limiting process is physical, not chemical. Why is it physical? Because for every grain which has these minerals uh, on the surface, so once you combine CO2 with it, you have a denser covering on the grain. And then further penetration into the grain becomes more difficult. So it's a, it's a limiting diffusion process. So the limitation is in the process of diffusion of CO2. It's not chemical. 
So I don't think there's any chemical species that specifically co uh, constitute a limiting species. If I get your question right, I hope this is fine. Okay, thank you. And I, uh, I hope that question is answered. Dr. Omar Alamudi uh, asking about uh, the uh, FRP bars. What do you think? I mean, with the terms of FRB, this problem of uh, uh, corrosion is uh, not there. So, uh, uh, do you think that uh, that alternative and the usage of uh, um, side in concrete? I'm sorry, I'm sorry please. Uh, so, sorry. And Dr. Ora uh, has another question which was not answered, probably. Yeah, Dr. I can Ora, see some questions. Well, before uh, you answer that, uh, before you answer, uh, before you answer, uh, Dr. Moody, can you, uh, Dr. Ora, what is your point? Point. Let me just go away from. Uh, oh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. All right. You see, uh, there is a clear stoichiometry. You know, you have presented. And the quotients are showing a stoichiometry. So there, there is, as per theory, there is a limiting reaction, as per theory. We, we cannot say there is none. I mean, you have, a, you have a stoichiometric equations and definitely you have a limiting reactant, you know, based on the theory. And based on how much of each reactant you have in the system. These two will give you a limiting reactant. You know, so that, that has to be clear first, you know. Number okay. two, what is extra then? And what is limiting? So these two have to be clear based on the stoichiometry and what you are actually putting. That will give you for sure the limiting reactant. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, this uh, reaction kinetics actually itself is a lot of... Uh, a lot of it's equilibria, by the way. It's not kinetics. It's equilibria. Okay. This, right. this is this is equilibrium, not kinetics. So it's, it's just showing you the equilibrium. Kinetics will be different, right? So so maybe it's better if you, it, it may be better, you know, it, it can expand a new, you know, vista for you. If you clearly look based on the stoichiometry, which is theoretical, and based on what actually you're putting in the system, it can yeah. tell you what is the limiting reactant, and then probably it can guide you in the in the right direction. This is the only thing. But anyway, thank you so much for a very nice talk. Huh? Thank you very much, Dr. Rora. And uh, I hope Dr. Said will take that into consideration. Yeah. Let's hear from Dr. Amudi. Dr. Amudi. Dr. Amudi, you can speak. You're, you're muted. You're muted. Unmute yourself. Dr. Amudi, unmute yourself. Okay, so I think so. Uh, I, I, I unmute, you unmute. Okay. You uh, unmute. Can I speak? Yeah, yeah. We hear you, yes. Uh, yeah, Dr. Said, thank you very, very much uh, for your excellent uh, research, which was initially uh, uh, conducted by you and uh, Ashra, uh, Mr. Sagaf and Dr. Shamshad. Now you know that uh, Saudi Aramco is interested in the usage of FRB and the uh, sequestration here by the reduction of, of uh, alkalinity, FRB will not be affected. So it will be the best solution for both you and Aramco together. I think you have to conduct research on this issue. Thank you. Yeah, you're right, uh, Professor. Thank you so much for this issue. Uh, at the early stage of ACC application, People thought that the solution for complete carbonation of concrete members is to yes. use effort, okay? But after the discovery of the simple fact that you can still maintain your alkalinity even after you apply ACC, then we add liberty to either use steel bars or FRP. Don't forget, FRP can only work in tension, not in compression. Still, when in the compressive zones of uh, uh, strong members, you still have to use something different from FRP. And that is why it is interesting to note that it is possible to maintain the alkalinity of concrete, even if you do deep penetration of CO2. And this can link me to the question I can see from uh, one uh, questioner here. He said, 
how could you maintain the alkalinity of concrete even after uh, pumping CO2 into concrete? Yeah. Okay. Yes, you can maintain the alkalinity because what CO2 does is to combine with uh, Portland light. Portland light is the main uh, species responsible for the high alkalinity. So when you react with Portland light to form calcite, you have a reduced pH. Okay. So what we okay. do. Let's, let's move to the next question, I think so. Um, yeah. so this is answered, I guess. So this uh, uh, Fardan uh, Silas is asking, as the case of carbon dioxide sequestration in construction material, do you have any experience on uh, chemical reactions that might be involved in uh, hydrogen storage? Hydrogen storage? Hydrogen storage? Chemical reaction that might be involved in hydrogen storage. Well, I, I think this may fall out of our scope. Yeah. So we can consider this uh, at uh, IRC CBM as a individual yeah. collaborative so, research, I guess. But, but, but this can be considered in, in uh, subsequent uh, in, uh, collaborative uh, research with other centers. So we can look into this. Yeah. And Valid Dal uh, Osh has a good question. Is that, uh, do you think that this carbon dioxide, which uh, you put into the concrete, will be released if fire takes place in the building? No, it will not be released. Uh, or let me say it will be released. Yes or no, depends on the extent of fire because fire temperature can reach 1200 Celsius, okay? And calcite will break down thermally at 900 Celsius, approximately. So it is quite possible that if you have sustained fire, which has not been quenched. Remember, fire temperature grows over time. So if you quench the fire on time, you will not attain the breakdown temperature of calcite. However, if you don't quench the fire on time, you will attain 900, calcite will break down. Not only calcite, everything in concrete will break down, and even the building itself is collapsed, and CO2 is released back to the atmosphere. So it means fire is not good for a carbonated concrete. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess uh, we are now running out of time, already one hour and 45 minutes of uh, a great first uh, uh, KICS uh, uh, seminar by IRC CBM under the KICS uh, platform. And there are a lot of uh, other interesting questions and uh, Jeremy has a lot of questions for, in fact, and I'd like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Jeromi to talk to Dr. Uh, Said directly to get uh, those uh, uh, four questions answered. And there are some other questions which we couldn't uh, uh, handle in this particular uh, presentation. Most of it is answered. And uh, uh, we end this uh, webinar with a, a lot of thanks to the speaker. Um, Dr. Said for a very nice presentation. The audience really liked it. And ask, audience is asking if they can have a copy of the presentation. I don't know what's the uh, requirement for that. Some of them are asking. And uh, also thank you, uh, Dr. Rosta for um, arranging this uh, uh, webinar with the kicks. And uh, hopefully we will have uh, a lot of other interesting topics uh, in our uh, future seminar. And the next one will be in November 2021. So we plan to have at least uh, three uh, this year. And uh, uh, next year, then we will have a new set of topics. So uh, thank you all uh, attendees, which was about 43 and now almost uh, uh, half of them have left. We have 28 now. So thank you all very much for being with us. And I hope that you all enjoyed this presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Sai. Thank you so much. Uh, the presentation is available if permitted to be shared. Uh, I will share it for all the participants. Thank it's, you. Uh, and with this, we sign off from this particular webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for attending.